This lecture is going to deal with reconstruction of the American South after the Civil War time period. Um, this is a very critical time in American history. Um, I declare that 1865 is the most critical year in American history up to our time period. Um, a lot has happened in 1862. I mean, I'm sorry, in 1865. Uh, the American South is totally destroyed from war. The cotton production that was once the, the economic empire of America is gone away. Uh, it will never resume to where it was before. Uh, the American North has, has totally industrialized this war. Um, the United States was the ninth largest industrial country in 1860. In 1865, we're number one. I mean, number two. We're number two. England is still ahead of us. We'd be number one by 1900. So this war is going to build industrial America. It's going to destroy agrarian America. We got to find ways to, to bring the country back together again as quickly as possible. And of course, you got to realize the president was shot and killed during this time period. If Abraham Lincoln had lived, it had been a whole different ball game than what it was after Reconstruction. Uh, Lincoln had a plan, and uh, when he dies, the plan goes with him. And I think his plan would have been a very good one for this time period. We'll discuss that here in a little bit, what Lincoln wants to do. The American South is not only destroyed economically, they have high inflation. Um, a, a pack of wood for a fireplace would cost you up to $5 a stick. Uh, a, a barrel of flour would cost you $300 in the American South. Inflation was 9,000% in the South when this war came to an end. That's the same number the Nazi Germany, I'm sorry, that Germany had after, after World War I. World War I saw Germany with a 9,000% inflation rate. And of course, Germany's inflation is gonna to lead to the rise of Adolf Hitler. It's gonna to rise to the two World War II. So America's got some serious issues here to look at uh, during this time period. You've also got Hundreds of thousands of people are homeless from this war. They have lost their land. They have lost their property. A lot of these folks are former slaves that had no place to go to. You have a food shortage across the South during this time period. And across the country, we got over 600,000 dead American boys. The exact number of 620,000 American boys who have died in this war. Okay. It's also during this war that new wealth comes to the American people. For the first time, we got a term that is called a millionaire. A lot of people got wealthy from this war. A lot of industrial leaders got wealthy from this war. The United States federal government guaranteed them a profit during this war. And of course, a lot of these owners of, of industries took the profits that they made and put them in their own pockets. There's a lot of federal subsidies going out during this time period. And a lot of that federal money to go support industries to expand the war went to pockets of individuals. So you had a lot of swindling, a lot of embezzling, a lot of crazy stuff going on that nobody was checked on, that nobody paid the price for. They got away with it. Of course, we started building our railroads across the country during the war. These railroad companies also got federal dollars to expand across the country. Uh, they were getting paid $15,000 a mile for each track that was laid across the, across the prairie land. In the mountains, they got paid $45,000 per mile per track. And so the railroads got wealthy off the federal government during this time period. So you got a lot of issues here to deal with. Abraham Lincoln saw the new wealthy class, and he realized they had made great profits and great strides from the war. So therefore, he decides that it's his job as president to find a way to rein these folks in. He says, if we do not find a way to make these folks do not want war in the future, we've got to rein them in because they'll want war after war after war to make more and more money for themselves. War becomes big business for the American industries here in this time period. And Lincoln says, let's go through and how these industrial leaders rebuild the South. Let them go in. 
and let them build the new railroads and new, the, the new textile mills and rebuild the harbors and the docks and rebuild the infrastructure, the roads across the South. They can go through and, and be, rebuild the burned out areas like Atlanta and Columbia, South Carolina. Let them rebuild these cities, let them rebuild Richmond. Let them bring in new industries and new, and new businesses into the South and totally transform them from agrarian area of the country into an industrialized region of the country. So there's a lot going on here, guys, uh, in this time period. Um, Lincoln wanted a quick reconstruction. He wanted the wealthy class to sponsor Southern reconstruction. He wanted to rebuild the Southern economy to be more industrialized. He wanted to rein in the wealthy class who made tons of money off this war. And he wanted to find a way to make the former slaves middle class as quickly as possible. That's the big issue here, guys. We want to take these former slaves and make them middle class as quickly as possible. All right, we started doing this. We, we, we tried doing this and it worked until Congress gave up on it in the early 1870s and did away with it. And all these people who had farms and had, were, were looking at middle class uh, livings are gonna to be totally disenfranchised. They're gonna get thrown out of, they're gonna get thrown under the bus is what it boils down to. And these folks are still trying to become middle class in a lot of areas across the country because they were let down by the federal government here in the early 1870s, okay? Now, one of the important people I want you guys to know about is a gentleman whose name is Oliver Howard. Oliver O. Howard. He was a general during the war and he's a general under General Sherman. William Sherman was his commanding officer. William, I'm sorry, Oliver Howard is gonna lead federal troops out of Atlanta, Georgia down to Macon. And from Macon over to Dublin, Georgia and on into Savannah, Georgia. He has a Southern route on that, on that march to the sea that Sherman is going to produce in 1864. Sherman's army went up through Millage Village's Facebury and crossed the northern tier, but Oliver Howard went across the southern tier, okay? When General Sherman and General Howard and all these people arrived in Savannah, Georgia in the middle of December of 1864, they had over 10,000 refugees that were following the army. These folks were, were former slaves who realized you get, your, you get your freedom now or you'll never get it. So they got in behind the Union Army and marched their way into Savannah, Georgia during November, of 18, November and December of 1864. General Sherman realized he had a real problem with all these refugees. They're hungry, they need medicine, they're also are ill clad, they're not well clothed. And so General Sherman is gonna to turn to Oliver Howard to take care of this problem. Oliver Howard is going to take these refugees, these some 10,000 slaves, and he's going to put them on Tybee Island, Hilton Head Island, and St. Simon's Island. He decided that they'd be well protected on an island than they were on the land. He realized the owners of these slaves would probably want to kill them or do away with them. <clears throat> so he decided to put them on the sea islands for their own protection. Then Oliver Howard sent word to New York City to send ships down that were full of supplies. They had food commodities on board these ships. They had cheese, they had bread, they had milk, they had sugar, they had coffee, they had flour, cornmeal, various kinds of beef. They were brought in, vegetables, they were brought into these people on these sea islands so they could feed these folks. That's the first concern was feeding all these folks. The next concern, is try to make sure they have good medical supply, medical attention. So they brought in all kinds of physicians, they brought in various kinds of nurses, and they also brought in all these medical supplies. And then finally, they decided they need to find a way to house these people, okay? Oliver Howard realized across the South were thousands of acres of land that had been abandoned by the white ownership. A lot of these folks had moved western, had moved west during the war. They wanted to escape the war. They moved west, and a lot of folks did this. They also had men who were killed in the war. They did not have a place to come back to. Their wives and families had gone elsewhere. When the word had come, the husband had died. And so there's a lot of land that's left vacant here across the South. 
In late January of 1865, Congress had heard about the work of Oliver Howard and what he's doing down in Georgia. And so they decided to bring Oliver Howard to the nation's capital to tell Congress his plan toward helping these former slaves. And from this comes what is called the Freedmen's Bureau. The, Fee the Freedmen's Bureau was established in 1865. Oliver Howard will head up the Bureau. And their job is the following, to make sure that all of these former slave families are brought together and they're placed on 40 acres of land. Every slave family shall get 40 acres of land. 40 acres of land made you middle class here in this time period. They're gonna go from slavery to middle class almost instantly, okay? They also had a plan to help the poor whites in this program, to help them get land ownership also, and solve the problem of squatters going across the country. So it's gonna benefit a lot of people here, this Freedmen's Bureau. It's mainly designed for the former slaves, okay? Well, guys, this land be became identifiable here in this time period, and these slave families started getting 40 acres of land across the South. They had they built their homesteads on here, they built their gardens on here, they planned their gardens on here. They became concerned with growing various kinds of agricultural crops, but particularly tobacco or cotton. Those are your two big ones here in this time period. And so these folks here, are entering into a first phase of middle-class existence from the Freeman's Bureau, okay? They still send them commodities. They still got food supplies. They still got medicine, but they also got land. And that's the most important thing you can have here in this time period is land, okay? If you're a former slave and you've got four or five boys, young men, 40 acres would be very manageable and you can make lots of money off 40 acres. You can diversify those farms into different kinds of plots. One section for tobacco, one section for cotton, one section for timber, one section for raising cattle or hogs, are, are, are getting involved with dairy companies and providing dairy milk to these companies. There's various ways that these guys diversify here and make more money from themselves, okay? Another area that Mr. Howard realized was a problem was education. In order to become good citizens, these former slaves must know how to read and write. They must become educated. Slaves were not educated in the American South after 1836. That is two generations of people who are not taught how to read and write in the American South. Mr. Howard is gonna put out word across the North that the, that the Freedmen's Bureau needs school teachers. And over 3,000, school teachers across the north are going to head south to open up schools for these former slaves. These freedmen schools are gonna be elementary schools. They're gonna teach, the teach the people here the basics of reading and writing. That's the most important thing to get them started. If you can read and write, you can become a good citizen, okay? So 3,000 school teachers head to the American South. And what you saw was the following. In the mornings, the older folks and the kids would go to school. These are the people who could not work the fields. These are the old folks. Them and the young folks would go to school. In the afternoon and the evening, the, the young adults and the adults would go to school. They'd go to night school. And these folks started progressing in the school system from reading and writing, they started teaching math and then science. They went through and taught them new, new farming techniques and, and ways to improve the farms. They learned more about housekeeping, how to build, how, how to have nice, stable homes. They learned all about history and, um, and the importance that history played uh, in the scheme of life among these people. So these folks are going to become a well-educated bunch of people here. And within four years, Oliver Howard is beginning to build colleges for the former slaves. The white state university system, the white schools would not allow the black schools to attend. Here in the South, they also would not allow the Hispanic kids to attend the white schools. And out in California, the Asian American kids are not allowed to, to attend the white schools. So you still see segregation going on across the country by different ethnic groups who are being left out here during this time period. But Oliver Howard is gonna start building what is called the traditional black universities. 
These traditional black universities will include universities like Alcorn State, Tuskegee Institution, Morehouse College, Fisk University, Shaw University, Hampton Institute, and Oliver Howard College in Washington, D.C. And these kids began to flock to these universities once they became basically educated uh, and understood the, the importance of advanced education. And so these kids started going to these, these, these all black universities here starting in the late 1860s and they flocked to them. And we realize here that these people who have been put down all these years as slaves were highly educated. These kids could learn, these kids could progress, and these kids could produce a new middle class for these former slaves. You know, another class of people I did not mention were the artisans. You had black artisans on these plantations. They were, they were, they were uh, carpenters and sawyers and tanners of leather. They were millers of grain. They were barbers, they were butchers, they were bakers. They were blacksmiths. There were coopers who made wooden boxes and wooden barrels. And these folks left slavery already in middle class because they could go to the towns and the cities and open up shops here and start their own little businesses here that they completely owned and completely operated. So your first middle class is gonna come guys from all these artisans who came out of the big house and came out of the plantation system as the workers produced goods for the plantation system or the old masters, if you will. And so these folks enter into a new occupation here, guys, or take these occupations, I should say, to new areas in order to survive. And I'll tell you something, a lot of slaves moved from the South. When slavery ended, a lot of people moved and they carried their work with them. And so they moved to Texas or they moved to California. They were still barbers, they were still bakers and so forth. And they took care of their own economy here in this time period. So your first real middle class of your former slaves are going to be the people who are artisans. The ones who are in the Freedmen's Bureau programs, these are your poor, your poorer slaves. And most of these guys were slave hands. They are, are field hands. They worked in the, on the plantation fields. And so what they did know there are cultural pursuits, even though they were not real good at mechanical or engineering are making items by hand. They were more, they're more or less in the farming group here. And that's the ones who are gonna really suffer here during reconstruction. The artisans are gonna be do okay. The ones that can send their kids to, to college will usually be okay. But be the field hands will be the ones who are gonna be in more trouble than anybody else will during, during, the, uh, during the reconstruction period, okay? The freed farmers were promised 40 acres of land by the federal government, they got a federal land grant, a federal land certificate that this property was their property. And they also are gonna get a mule and some tools to plow with and to farm with. So the program was called 40 Acres and a Mule, which will make the former slaves middle class as quickly as possible. Okay, all right. So guys, this is all being planned out before Lincoln dies. We have, a, we have a program in place to make these folks middle class. Lincoln's got a program to make sure the wealthy class are not really greedy and take over everything. You know, he told the American people in 1865, I might've created a problem here with all these wealthy folks. They made so much money off this war, they want war after war to, to supply themselves. But more importantly is, they gotten so wealthy that they can buy out politicians. Then we're not careful one day the wealthy class will control the presidency, they'll control, they'll control the Congress, and they'll control the Supreme Court. And America is gonna have, have trouble trying to keep its democracy when all this takes place. They might there'll be a problem with democracy when all this takes place. The wealthy class could actually end democracy because of their greed. That's why Lincoln wanted to rein them in during this time period. But Lincoln made a big, a big mistake. He brought in a Southern Senator into the White House as Vice President. This gentleman he did not go home during the war. He stayed in Washington, D.C. all during the war. And a lot of people thought he was a traitor. The Southerners thought he was a traitor.
His name is Andrew Johnson. Mr. Lincoln brought in Andrew Johnson as vice president, hoping the South would see a friend in him and make reconstruction a little bit easier for the people across the South. So Andrew Johnson comes in. I want to tell you guys something. Andrew Johnson is not the person for this job. He has not been trained. He does not know the agendas of Abraham Lincoln. He has none of the, none of the background that Lincoln has or his advisors has. And he's going to get totally underwater as president. He's the worst man that Mr. Lincoln could have put into office during this time period. I want to tell you, and I'm serious about this, the most critical time in American history is when a president dies, either assassinated or dies from natural causes. When this takes place, the new vice president is not usually certified or ready for the job. Mr. Johnson had been vice president about six weeks before Lincoln was shot and killed. I think about, I think about Mr. Roosevelt with Harry Truman. Here again, Roosevelt died in, in April, of 18, April of 1945. Mr. Truman had been vice president since, since January the 20th. And he didn't know anything because Mr. Roosevelt controlled the whole show. Mr. Truman didn't know about the atomic weapons we had developed until we got one tested out in Alamogordo, Mexico in July of 1945. This is critical times here, guys. And Mr. Johnson does not, is not ready for the presidency. If I'd been Abraham Lincoln, I'd have put William Seward in as vice president. His secretary of state, Mr. Seward, Mr. Lincoln started off as political enemies, became very close friends while Mr. Seward was in the cabinet. And Mr. Seward knew exactly what Lincoln had planned because the two men had discussed it. Lincoln wanted his opinion on various things. Another gentleman was Solomon Chase, who was head of the Treasury Department. He, he's the one who brought back the national banking system that helped the North win the war. Mr. Chase, just like Mr. Seward, knew what was going on. The two, the two men became close friends of Lincoln during this time period. Now, I will tell you this. William, William Seward remained Secretary of State under Andrew Johnson, and he's the man who buys Alaska from the Russians for $7 million. This happened in, this happened in 1867 time period. So Mr. Seward is still around, but Mr. Johnson, President Johnson, does not do much with him. And I think if he buddied up with, with William Seward, he might have had a little bit more of a, of a success story in the presidency than what he's going to have. Solomon Chase becomes the new Supreme Court Chief Justice when Roger Deney dies in 1866. So at least Solomon Chase goes to the Supreme Court, and that's a good position for him to be in. But I just wonder what happened if, if, if Mr. William Seward had been, had, been, had been vice president when Lincoln was shot and killed, and Andrew Johnson got totally left out of all of this stuff. Because Andrew Johnson is the problem. He is the problem here, guys. He's the one who creates modern American politics. Before this time period, the two parties pretty much got along with each other and they pretty much made decisions together. Nowadays, we're totally fragmented. They don't have to do anything to do with either party, they don't have anything to do with each other. And they're, they're hard and slow about passing laws and rules. They don't care about the American people because they're more concerned about party politics than they are running the country. That's a real problem. And this comes from Andrew Johnson and his craziness as president. Okay, the first thing Andrew Johnson is gonna do is he's gonna tell Congress that he's gonna be tough on the South. He takes the stance that the South must be reconstructed in a harsh way. And he's kind of mean to the South here in May and June and July of 1865. He talks really bad about the South. He's very belligerent toward the people here in this time period in the South, okay? Mr. Johnson, however, is gonna change his tune in August. In August of 1865, Congress goes home on recess. They had to go home to work. That's a, new, that's a new term for you guys to realize that Congress had to work. 
that these men did not make enough money to support themselves in Congress. So therefore, they had to go home part of the year and actually work. A lot of these guys were lawyers. They took up the law again. A lot of these guys were shopkeepers and, and industrial leaders. They had to go home and, and, and work on their businesses and, and try to make sure the business, stays, the business stays solvent and the businesses were making profit here in this time period. Yes, Congress had to work. They had to go home to take care of their businesses, to take care of their jobs. I wish that was true today. But it's not. They get paid way too much money for doing nothing up there and get complete benefits and all the health care. They have better benefits than anybody in America has. It is not fair for them to have all the good stuff and all the rest of us put up with all the leftovers. And this is where it all started with Andrew Johnson. Okay? Congress goes home. Andrew Johnson sends word to all the southern states, the border states and the southern states, and they tell them, he tells them, I want y'all to get busy and write brand new state constitutions. And in your constitutions, you must outlaw slavery. Slavery has got to go away. Okay? All right. And then he tells them that you go through and give the, the former slaves a little bit of freedom. That's totally up to you legislators to decide how you want to handle the former slaves. But you got to outlaw slavery. That's the first thing. Well, guys, also during this time period, the states are ratifying what is called the 13th Amendment. Amendment number 13 is going to start during the time that Lincoln is still alive. The 13th Amendment is going to kill slavery across America forever. Remember, the item that kills slavery is going to be the 13th Amendment. It's not the Emancipation Proclamation, it's the 13th Amendment. And when that's been passed, guys, all the slaves in America will be free. Well, here in the summer of 1865, your southern states and your northern states are ratifying the 13th Amendment. It will not be ratified until December. And in December of 1865, the 13th Amendment becomes law of the land and slavery begins to be phased out. And it's gonna take them until the middle part of 1866 to kill slavery across the Union. It's gonna be slow moving. A lot of the old masters won't accept it. It's gonna take some legal actions in some places to take care of this. But the 13th Amendment is what's gonna kill slavery. Slavery ends by the middle part of 1866 across the country, okay? So these folks will be freed here. So the Southern states must say slavery is ended, plus ratify the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, okay? He also tells the, Southern, the Southerners, I want you people that were involved in the war, cabinet members, congressional members, Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of the Confederacy, I want all you generals and all you soldiers who took part in this war to write me letters asking for a pardon. They said in September of 1865, some 1,800 letters a day came in to President Johnson to forgive them for being part of this war. These Confederate people are signing loyalty oaths and sending to the president. He had to go through and hire some 75 people to come in here to answer all these letters. And of course, he pardoned them as the letters came in. The State Archives in Florida on their Facebook page had an article several years ago about the Confederate soldiers of Tallahassee. And what they did was they all came together as a group. And they wrote a letter in which pretty much says that we are citizens of the United States, we'll defend her from shore to shore, we'll honor her constitution, you know, we'll, we'll value the, the culture of the United States. And some 100 men signed this document and they mailed it off to President Johnson. A few weeks later, it comes back to them, and this time it's signed by Johnson and they've all been pardoned. So you see all this happening here, guys, in this time period. By December of 1865, Andrew Johnson, the president, is totally convinced that Reconstruction is over with. He has single-handedly brought the South back into the country with no problem, with no major issue. Well, guys, when Congress comes back here in early December of 1865, the president does a joint 
addressed to the Congress, to the House and to the Senate, and he tells them that Reconstruction has ended. Well, guys, in the Republican Party is a new group who call themselves the Radicals. These Radical Republicans are made up of Thaddeus Stevens. They're also made up of Mr. Uh, Charles Sumner. Charles Sumner is a senator that Preston Brooks about killed in the Senate by beating him, beating up on him. Mr. Sumner said if the South wants to come back, they're going to pay dearly to do so. Well, these radicals want the South to pay for this war. They want to pay and pay dearly for this war. So Andrew Johnson is trying to upset their apple cart because he's already said they're reconstructed. And they're pretty teed off at the president. They said, we said, we should never let this man become president. He's a Southerner. We should have known better. He's a turncoat. And he's, he's going to end up having the South win the war after all. You got to be careful of people like, 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 uh, like Mr. Uh, Andrew Johnson. Well, Johnson told him, and he had all those documents with him of all the Southern states that had written constitution. They were all piled on the desk right here. And he says, here they are. Here's all these constitutions from the American South, and they have asked me for their forgiveness, and I have forgiven them. And in their constitutions, they have outlawed slavery and ratified the 13th Amendment of the Constitution. Oh, that made them mad. Those radicals got fighting mad about it. And Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner and their gang decided they wanted to see each of those documents and read them to themselves extremely carefully. They made a committee, guys. And this committee went through and read these documents. And then they got mad. In the middle of these documents were articles that were called the Black Codes. The Black Codes gave limited freedom, personal freedom, to the former slaves. Oh, they freed them. They were freed through the constitutions here. They were freed by the 13th Amendment. But that's all they got. That's all they got was just their freedom. That says that you cannot preach the gospel unless you are certified by the state. When do states license ministers? They do not. Ministers are licensed by the nomination that you belong to. Okay? They're not done by the state, separation of church and state. But here they said you got to be licensed by the state to preach the gospel if you're a black minister. It also said that black Americans, black citizens, could be charged for trespassing on the grass. They could be charged for little bitty crimes and which are not crimes. They tried to impose new curfews on these folks. They told these former slaves that you can never ever vote in an election and that you cannot sue a white person in court. And actually they told the black, the black citizens of the South that you cannot even sue in court because you're African-American. You cannot run for office. So these black codes give lots of restrictions on the freedoms of these former slaves. But here's the kicker. When the Northern states outlawed slavery in 1819, they too had black codes in their constitutions. These black codes would tell these former slaves up North that you cannot sue white folks in court. You cannot run for political office. Okay. You're not even eligible to an education in some of these states up here. One state, Illinois, I mean, in Indiana, want to get rid of all the black folks in the state, run them all off. So you had all this going on. So you point your finger at somebody and you've got three more pointing right at you. And these radicals realized the South had done the same thing the Northern states had done in 1819 to limit the freedom of former slaves. And so Congress is going to sit down here in 1866 and they write what is called the Civil Rights Act. The Civil Rights Act of 1866. Okay. This will be sent to the various states for revocation and it will become the 14th Amendment. 
the 14th Amendment gives full citizenship and full rights to the former slaves. I want to tell you something. In the 1940s and 1950s and 1960s, during all these civil rights acts, all these civil rights cases that we had, this amendment will be used to put down the laws of states that try to deny the rights to African Americans. The 14th Amendment will be used. In California, it'll be used to put down, to put down any kind of opposition to the rights of Chinese Americans or Japanese Americans or Asian Americans in general. It'll be used in Texas and along the Southwest border with Mexican Americans and Hispanic Americans, and Latino Americans. So you're gonna start seeing the 14th Amendment being used by the federal court systems all during the mid 20th century as we move into what is called the Civil Rights Movement for all the people here who've been left out because of white supremacy. And this amendment will hold true in a lot of cases here. Okay, it says all persons born all persons born are naturalized in the United States and subject to jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the states herein they reside. They are citizens of the state. No state shall make or enforce any laws which abridge the privileges or amenities of citizens of the United States. And this greatly expanded the civil rights and legal rights for all American citizens by protecting them from infringements by the states as well as by the federal government. All right, no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. This expanded the duties of the, this expanded the due process calls of the Fifth Amendment to apply to the states as well as to the federal government. So it makes you calling attention to problems that have been going on ever since the Bill of Rights had been written, okay? And finally, the, the Equal Protection Clause, not deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law, was clearly intended to stop state governments from discriminating against black Americans and over the years would play a key role in landmark civil rights cases. Okay? And its later, in its later sections, the 14th Amendment authorizes the federal government to punish states that violate or abridge their citizens' rights to vote reducing the state's position in Congress and mandating that anyone who engages in insurrection against the United States will not hold civil, military, or elected office. You hear that, guys? Anybody who engages in insurrection, that's overthrowing the American government. That's these little fringe groups out here like the Ku Klux Klan, the Pride Boys, and all this bunch. Okay? They shall cannot hold civil, military, or elected office without the approval of three quarters of the Congress. So a lot of these people out here in the day's world who are protesting, who are trying to buy and bring back white supremacy and so forth, they don't realize that they're violating the 14th Amendment. And this can be used to call them out here if it's needed to be done so in the future here, all right? So these radicals are gonna get a wake up call when these, when these black codes show up, and here comes the 14th Amendment Constitution. So number 14 is very, very important when it comes to the legal aspects of Reconstruction. The 13th Amendment gave the former slaves freedom. The 14th gives them equal protection under the law, and it gives them civil liberties. It's very important you realize this, okay? It's very important that you realize what's going on here, okay? These radicals decided that the South had not been punished for their sins, that they were being belligerent. And so in 1867, they're going to pass what is called the First Reconstruction Act, the First Reconstruction Act of the American South. They're going to send five military districts to occupy the American South, five military districts to occupy the American South. Virginia by itself was a district. North and South Carolina was a district. Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida were a district. Kentucky and Tennessee were a district. And Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas were a district. That's your five military districts here in this reconstruction process. Okay? And they put a, they put a general in charge of these different districts. And they brought in soldiers to enforce the law. They occupied the American South. 
With this occupation comes resistance. People do not like outsiders coming into their areas trying to control them. And that's very much true here, guys, in 1867. And the Southern people begin to resist it. Okay, they begin to resist it. Okay. Also in this time period, Northerners are going to come in here trying to bring in new industry and bring in new business for themselves. A lot of Northern lawyers and insurance agents and railroad men came into the American South here, guys, because they knew that the area was downtrodden and they could make a fortune off the backs of the problems of the Southerners. And these men were called carpet baggers. These men arrived usually with a carpet rhythmic briefcase. They take old carpet samples. You all seen the carpet samples. They're pretty good sized squares. And they'd sew the sides and the bottoms to another piece of carpet and have it open in the middle and have handles on it. And these were called carpet bags. And these carpet baggers came down here trying to find economic opportunity, mainly off the back of these Southerners. A lot of Southern people were so desperate economically that they joined up with the carpet baggers and helped them establish their businesses here across the South. And a lot of these people who did this were called scalawags. Scalawags are Southerners who have Northern carpet baggers establish themselves in Southern society and the Southern economic system here, okay? So you got occupation from the, I mean, from the military, and you've also got all these folks leading in from the North. And a lot of these guys were, were, were soldiers who had fought in these areas and liked the way the area looked. They liked Mobile, they liked New Orleans, they liked Natchez, they liked Jackson or Memphis. They decided to, or Atlanta, and they decided to come back here to live, to raise their families down here in the American South. And I about, about guarantee you the biggest factor of these guys coming in here is the weather. They don't get as cold down here as it does up north. It's easier to tolerate the southern winters, and ours are very mild down here in most cases. Where up there, they have pretty harsh winters. And so a lot of them came down here because of the weather. That's a major influence here in this time period. Well, when all these infiltrators come in here, here comes a new group of southerners who come out of the old vigilantes agenda of the Renaissance antebellum period. These people here, these vigilantes people, are the ones who put down social problems. Usually the minister of the church, being Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian, these ministers were head of these vigilantes committees. And the men around town, the Christian men around town, are the ones who joined up with the minister. And they look for people who are causing problems. You had a pedophile in the community, they went after him. You have a husband who beats his wife and kids, they go after him. You got a guy who tries to swindle people and he tries to cheat people and lies to people, they go after him. And these folks are threatened with a whipping. They will whoop these people. They'll get a cat of nine tails and, and beat them with, to, to make them change their ways. And they'll tell them, the next time I see your wife with a black eye, or I see your little kids with blue marks across their backs because you have beaten them with a belt, we're coming after you. And sure enough, several weeks later, the wife shows up and she's got a bruised face and got a black eye and her lips been cut. The next evening they go to find the man. And they'll take him out of the house and then in the front yard they will whip him. And he'll dread the day he messes with, with his wife. If you get 25 lashes across your back with a, with a cat of nine tails, you're going to be pretty, you're going to be pretty ate up. You're going to be pretty injured. And you don't want to go through that again. Okay. And the vigilantes committee sometimes had the power to hang people. If they were murderers or other things, they could hang these folks here. So from this agenda comes a new group who will call themselves the Ku Klux Klan. They are an organization for homeland security. Nathaniel Bradford Forrest, the old Civil War general, Nathaniel Bradford Forrest, becomes the leader of this group. 
They first formed in 1866 as a social club. Confederate soldiers come together as a social club, mainly to help each other out with their PTSD. Because that's a major problem these boys returned home from war was PTSD. And so these guys form what is called the Ku Klux Klan. And when the South is occupied by Northern troops, they become a terrorist organization against the United States Army, against the United States Congress. And the Ku Klux Klan begins to fight back. They start fighting back. And the ones who suffer the most from the Ku Klux Klan are the former slaves. If you start working closely with the United States government, or if you start getting real friendly with these soldiers and so forth, the Klan will come after you. If church groups go through and decide to go through and feed these Union soldiers, they decide to help these soldiers out here in the South, these black churches, they'll go in and burn down the church. They'll go down and they'll go through and burn down ministers' homes and homes of deacons and homes of anybody they feel is a threat to the white way of life across the South. The Ku Klux Klan was totally in belief of white supremacy. And you don't mess with the Ku Klux Klan or they'll come after you. They use intimidation to do it. The biggest intimidation was lynchings and burning down of buildings. You know, I pulled the lynching records from Mississippi from 1865 to 1955. That's the Emmett Till lynching in 1955. And I found over 28 typed pages with close to 40 people on each page that had been lynched just in Mississippi. Between 1865 and 1900 alone, across the South, we had over 100,000 lynchings, and that included children and also women. If they saw you as being a threat, if you smart mouth, if you talk back at them, whatever, they would lynch you. And the lynching techniques was very similar to what Adolf Hitler is going to do to Jewish people and the Holocaust. And what they did, guys, is they took the person that's being lynched, they took the person, they took up his britches, and they castrated him. They cut everything off. So you're bleeding out completely as they lift you by your neck on a rope into a tree. Billie Holiday sung a song called Strange Fruit Hanging from the Popular Trees. A, a, a song about lynchings. You guys can go to YouTube and pull up Billie Holiday singing Strange Fruit and hear her sing this song, okay? Guys, once the person has totally died, their legs are quit shaking, they're dead, they're totally bled out from being amputated, they build a fire under the person and they burn the body. Hitler used cyanide gas and then he burned the bodies in furnaces. So a lot of the cruelty of Adolf Hitler is going to come out of American history. The Holocaust, I mean the, the, uh, the Indian removal policies, and also the lynching policies here in the mid to late 1800s across America. By the way, the last lynching that we had in our area took place in 1936 in Mariana. A black gentleman was accused of raping a white woman. Actually, he was accused of killing this white woman. And they held him at the Jackson County Courthouse for four or five days while they publicized the lynching. They put lynching advertisements in the Atlanta paper, the Columbus, Georgia paper, the Montgomery and Birmingham paper, the Mobile, New Orleans paper, Pensacola News Journal, Tallahassee paper, the Jacksonville paper, the Tampa and Orlando paper, they had over 10,000 people come to Mariana on the railroad for the lynching. They turned to a big, huge social party here, guys, and they lynched this man. And you wonder where Harper Lee in the Roble, Alabama, which is about 200 miles from, from, from Mariana, not even that far, about 150 miles from Mariana. Harper Lee wrote about lynchings and how about how people were treated in Alabama during this time period, Tom Robinson and all this stuff. It was very common in her day. She was born in 1924, guys. She was 16 years old when this lynching took place in Mariana. 
She was 16 year old, she was 17 year old when the Scottsboro boys had trouble up in North Alabama. So she had plenty of material to work off of and she did it. And she impressed the American people by doing so. Okay, if you guys are not ready to kill a mockingbird, you better read it. You need to read that book. One book you should be, you should have read by this time in, 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 your, in your career, in your educational career. Okay? All right, guys. So here comes the Ku Klux Klan. Here comes all these problems here. Well, there's also a problem with Mr. Johnson. Congress has passed over 18 various bills to, to bring in reconstruction across the South, to bring in new programs and new ways of handling the South, and every one of them, Andrew Johnson has vetoed. Congress has overridden over 14 of them. That's hard to do to override a presidential veto. And they did it 14 times. And then they said he's got to go. We've got to find a way to get rid of Andrew Johnson. And so they made a trap. They made a political trap. They went through and passed a law called the Tenure of Office Act. The Tenure of Office Act said the president cannot fire cabinet members. The president cannot fire cabinet members. And they passed it. Well, they made old Andrew Johnson met and said, let them enforce it. He was not too happy with, with William Stanton, the head of the War Department. Bill Stanton was not a good friend of Andrew Johnson, and he fired him in violation of the Tenure of Office Act. Then he turned around and hired U.S. Grant, one of his big buddies, to be his new head of the War Department. Mr. Grant and Mr. Johnson had a long friendship. As a matter of fact, the two got arrested one afternoon in New York City. They were racing horses, they were actually there in carriages, racing each other through Central Park. They both got arrested for, 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 for speeding violations, and they were charged a $20 fine. Now, guys, that's like a $500 fine today. That's a lot of money in this time period. They were fined $25 for, for speeding through Central Park. So these two men were pretty rowdy with each other. And Mr. Johnson makes Mr. Grant the head of the War Department. Well, you know what Grant does in the War Department? He puts the Bureau of Indian Affairs under the War Department. What does that tell you? The Bureau of Indian Affairs has been a separate agency, now goes under the War Department. We're going to make war against the Indians again? It looks like it. It's going to be a hard time for the Indian people all over again. They've suffered over and over. And here it comes again for the umpteenth time. And Mr. Grant's the one who does all this stuff. Okay? Well, the House decided that Mr. Johnson has violated the law. And here in August of 1867, they start impeachment inquiries. Finally, on the 24th day of February, 1868, the House of Representatives are going to impeach the president. Just like Mr. Trump got impeached and Bill Clinton got impeached, Mr. Johnson's impeachment looks just like it. It's a political impeachment. They didn't do anything that was high crimes and misdemeanors and mostly political ideology and political junk they didn't like. Bill Clinton's problem was he lied to us about Monica Lewinsky. You know, he said he didn't have sex with her. If he said, I had sex with her and had a good time, it had been a whole different ball game. We'd accepted it and gone on with it. But he had lied to us. You don't lie to the American people. Because it eventually is going to catch up with you. All right. Richard Nixon found that out pretty quickly in 1960, 19, 1974. When he when he had to go to the impeachment, he knew he knew they got him and he had to quit. He had to resign and get out of the office, or he would have been impeached completely here. So Mr. Johnson is impeached February the 24th, uh, 16, I'm sorry, 1867. The Senate goes into the hearings here behind the behind the Congress or behind the Senate, behind the House. And the Senate is going to have the impeachment trial take place on May the 16th, 1868. One vote kept Mr. Johnson from being impeached. He was saved by one vote. But his presidency is destroyed. From May of 1868 until March of 1869, 
Mr. Johnson is a lame duck president. Nothing he does is going to be approved of. Not much happens here in this time period, okay? In 1868, in November of 1868, U.S. Grant is going to run for the presidency as a Republican. He's backed up by the radicals. Running against U.S. Grant is going to be Horatio Seymour. Mr. Seymour is a Democrat, and he is a governor of New York. So the governor of New York is going to run against the old general, U.S. Grant. Mr. Grant runs on his military record. All right. Mr. Seymour, a Democrat, is more concerned about social issues here in America. President Grant gets elected on March the 4th, 1869. He takes the office of president, and he brings his friends with him. He's just like Andrew Jackson. The old General Jackson is going to be booked in by General Grant. He brings his friends into high offices. He's going to have problems with the news media. You're going to start seeing a lot of corruption in the, in the cabinet members and across the country as far as that concerned. And Mr. Grant is going to totally support big business. The one area that Lincoln told us to be wary of. If you give them too much power, they will take over the country. They'll take over the nation. Okay? And Mr. Grant is going to get in bed with big business. Okay? To tell you the truth, Mr. Mr. Grant is going to face some real issues here in this time period. Mainly because of the, because of, because of the depression shows up. Mr. Grant smokes 19 cigars a day. And when he, come, when he gets by two hours before supper time, before dinner time, they run him out of the White House. And he'll go to the lobbies of hotels to read newspapers and smoke cigars. And here are various business people who come talk to him, trying to get federal money to help them out. And of course, these folks were called lobbyists. And so the lobbyists get in bed with your politicians. So here comes a major issue of lobbying, which is still a major issue today. These lobbyists today will, will push for different kinds of laws to, for their own special interests. They push for war in which they can make more money. And the lobbyist problem arrives here with Mr. Grant. And it still continues on today. It's one of the major problems of today's world is the lobbyist here. Okay? Now, one of the major issues here about the former slaves is they do not have the right to vote and Congress begins to deal with it. And here on the agenda when Mr. Grant does take office is to bring in an amendment to allow former slave men over the age of 21 to vote. Okay. How do the American women feel about this? They've been trying to get the vote ever since the Declaration of Independence. And they've been denied over and over and over again. And here come the American women and say, they say, if you pass an amendment that allows black men to vote, it should be a, an amendment that allows all Americans over the age of 21 to vote. Susan, Lucy Stone, Susan B. Anthony became heavily involved in trying to push this agenda to get the women the right to vote. All right. It has to be ratified by all the states become an amendment to the Constitution to do this. And a lot of people in Congress says it'll be easier to get black men to vote than it will to get white women. That we'll see resistance in the states if we put, uh, put white women on this amendment. And so therefore the women were denied because they feel like the vote would not pass. Okay? And so these ladies, they get mad and they go after the most desirable thing that men want, alcohol. They start another round of temperance movements to shut down bars across the country. They'll shut down the neighborhood bar first, then get the bar in the next neighborhood and the next neighborhood until the whole city is totally dried up. Then they head for the county, get the county dried up, and then they head for the state. And these ladies, by 1915, that's some, what, 30 years, 35 years, they bring in prohibition because their work trying to dry up the liquor because the men would not allow them to vote. These women got down and dirty with this one, guys. 
You do not deny the American women, they got a lot of clout in this time period, okay? On the 3rd of February, 3rd of February, 1870, the United States and its states will approve what is called the 15th Amendment. Number 15 is ratified on February the 8th, 1870. And this guaranteed the right to vote to all people, or all men, I should say, over the age of 21, regardless of race, color, or previous conditions or servitude. Because they can vote regardless of race, color, our previous conditions are of servitude. So now all men over the age of 21 can vote. They can vote. To make sure the Southern men can vote, they put the, tr the troops in charge of polling places. By putting the troops in polling places, guarantee the vote of all men over the age of 21. Okay, and during this time, you're gonna see a large number of men, black men, who become local officials here and their counties from the vote. You'll have some go to state legislators, you'll have some state governors, and you'll have several men who'll go to Congress from this, okay? So guys, you're gonna start seeing African-Americans involved in politics here starting in 1871. This will be good to about 1790. And you'll start seeing all these folks be disenfranchised from the vote from various rulings, from various laws. Okay, so these men early on have a right to vote, mainly when the federal troops are in place here to guarantee the voting rights here in these towns, okay? In 1871, President Grant says, the real problem in the American South is terrorism. And I'm gonna make sure the United States Army gets heavily involved in putting down the Ku Klux Klan. And in Congress, they passed what is called the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. Mr. Grant made war against the Klan. They said that any man that is caught in Klan activities, is caught red-handed involved in Klan activities, shall be arrested and spent up to 10 years in federal prison. Do y'all know they caught so many Ku Klux Klan members in this time period? The United States had to build a new federal penitentiary just for the Klan. The new penitentiary is still in existence today, it's still being used today. It's a penitentiary at Atlanta. The federal pen in Atlanta is where they started off with Ku Klux Klan members, and now we still house federal prisoners in Atlanta. So that, is, that, that prison has a long history here, guys, starting here with Reconstruction time period and going against the Ku Klux Klan. This worked. President Grant killed the Klan. The Klan is forced to go underground. You won't see a big Klan movement again until 1915 when World War I begins. By 1925, the Ku Klux Klan will call themselves the Protectors of American Morality. And you'll have close to 10, member, 10 million Klan members from coast to coast, including women and children in the Ku Klux Klan. In Connecticut, Massachusetts, and all your northern states, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Wisconsin, Minnesota, the Dakotas, Colorado, California, Oregon, and Washington State, you'll have big pockets of the Ku Klux Klan. Sometimes the Klan was bigger in these states than it was in Alabama. But the Klan is gonna take off here in the 1920s as a moral protectors of American society. And you all know your presidents approved them? Woodrow Wilson, William, uh, Warren G. Harding, Calvin Coolidge all said the Klan was good for America. It was good for the morale of America to have a Ku Klux Klan. In 1925, the Ku Klux Klan marched in Washington, D.C. Over 250,000 Klan members marched on Pennsylvania Avenue. I have the film shift strips. I have the film rolls of that on your, on your audio, on your videos section here on Blackboard. You can go and watch it and see what happened here and what it looked like when all these people are marching down Washington, D.C. It's a scary sight. 
and could it happen again, if it happened again, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Because the Klan is very active again in American society. The white supremacists are very active again. The neo-Nazis are, are, active, are active again. There's various groups. And of course, they violate the 14th Amendment. They don't realize that they bring federal charges on them using the 14th Amendment. They might have, have to go through guys in the next 20 years and build a new federal prison to house all these folks. Who knows what's going to happen here uh, in American history? Okay? So, guys, the Ku Klux Klan is going to be put down by Mr. Grant, and Mr. Grant is going to say the American South is a lost cause. The American South is a lost cause. And they start pulling money away from Southern Reconstruction. They're going to shut down the Freedmen's Bureau. That's the worst thing they could have done, is to shut down the Freedmen's Bureau. Because now these folks with their property that was given to them by the federal government after the war, legally assigned to them, their property is on the chopping block. They could, they could easily lose their property. They could easily lose their property here in this time period. Okay? Mr. Grant is going to promote going west. He believes the American West is the promised land. The American South is a lost cause, and the American West is the promised land. Out here, you have mining camps, you got railroads, you got silver, gold, bauxite. You got all kinds of materials out here that can be used in construction, that can be used here for industrialization. You got iron ore, and you got coal, and all this stuff out here. And so they're going to start really promoting the American West during this time period, okay? And of course, the Western railroads are gonna be completed during this time period. The Northern Pacific, the Union and Central Pacific, the Santa Fe, and the Southern Pacific will be completed by 1871. The first one completed was the Union and Central Pacific and 1869 out in Utah, it came together. So you have the Northern Pacific, the Union Pacific, the Santa Fe, and the Southern Pacific. And these railroads are getting federal funding. They're getting millions of dollars. They're using low, low cost labor by former slaves and Chinese people and poor white people and Irishmen. And they're making tons of money for themselves. In 1873, Three years at the big railroad boom, these railroads gave their owners big bonuses. Their vice presidents, their chief operation officer, their president, board members received big stock dividends and big payouts here because the railroads had lots of money and retained earnings. They paid out so much money, they bankrupted themselves. This sounds like General Motors in 2008. Those big companies that went through and gave out big benefits to themselves, the insurance companies and various people, and it led us into a recession, or actually a depression in, 18, in, in 2008. The one that we're still trying to deal with today. Trying to make sure we don't go back into it again today. And the culprits were these owners who gave themselves big bonuses. You know, guys, the Constitution deals with piracy. But the piracy it deals with is on the high sea. But what about the land pirates? We have a lot of corporations that are being controlled by pirates. They try to go through and buy other com companies, make themselves bigger. When they go through it and spend about 10 or 15 years of getting a big corporation developed, they'll go through and give themselves a $500 million bonus or a, tr or a billion dollar bonus. You know, it's crazy. How much money does it take for a person to live on? And I think people who make 25, 30, 40 million dollars a year are totally out of line. They're totally out of line. that they'd be paying for health care for, for their workers. The federal government was never supposed to go through and pay for health care. Corporations were. It's part of your, of, your, of your benefits package 
and a corporation in the 1920s was health insurance and life insurance and burial insurance and all this stuff is never intended for the federal government to take, about, take up these different issues. It needs to go back into the hands of owners of corporations. What would it cost Walmart to spend $5 billion to help its employees out? They would never lose it. They would never miss it. They would never miss it. And yet they won't do it because corporate greed is given the license here in this time period. And of course, we bail these folks out. President Grant bails them out because of the lobbyist who comes and sees him begging for money in those hotel lobbies. It should never happen. The Constitution does not discuss, discuss bailing out industries of any kind. We believe in laissez-faire economics where people have free competition and they survive for or against what's going on in the marketplace. And you know every 20 years, your products have got to change because technology changes. You can't sell a 1968 telephone in America today. Those, those old Bell telephones we used to buy at Walmart for $17 and had the rotary dial on them or the push button dials by 1980. You can't use them no more. You can't sell them. You've got to evolve with the marketplace. And that's the whole idea behind all this stuff. Make these people reinvest their money into new technology, reinvest into new inventions, reinvest into, into new products, better products, new kinds of medicines and so forth. Okay? And so for, therefore, you got a major problem in 1873 when that depression hits. Mr. Grant has declared the South a lost cause. What do they do for Southerners? These old blue-blooded Southern Democrats, the Bourbons as they called them here in this time period, realize that they can get control of Southern politics again. They can get, they can get in control of Southern politics again, okay? And by doing so, they can do away with regionally all these various laws that are put upon them by the federal government. They can find ways to, to, to nullify these laws and what it boils down to, okay? So the South begins to regain its power here from the Panic of 1873. And Southern blue blood democratic bourbons are gonna take over Southern politics again. You're gonna start finding a way to regain their political clout. Okay? I want you guys to realize something else that's going on here in America. By this time, America is a violent place. Before the war, before the before the Civil War time period, we did have murder. We had stabbings and we had people who were strangled to death and all this kind of stuff. People who were sat on fire, thrown off of buildings. We had all this take place. But after the war, the violence with gunfire was extremely bad. We had a lot of homicides using weapons. The American people got their hands on lots of weapons during and after the American Civil War. I mean, go out west, watch these cowboys out here out west and how they had gunslingers and they had shootouts and bank robberies and train robberies and all this stuff going on out west. And the violence was terrific out here with gun violence. If you guys get a chance sometime, you go back to my childhood and y'all go to YouTube and y'all watch Gunsmoke. You go watch about a 1958 Gunsmoke where Burt Reynolds was the, was the blacksmith in town with Marshall Dillon and Festus. And y'all watch those, those that, that, that show, Gunsmoke. And you can see the social issues they dealt with with gun violence here in Dodge City back in the back in the 1880 time period. And I'm not saying it's actual true history, but it is representative. You get an idea how bad it really was here. And there's some pretty interesting gun smoke. I still watch gun smoke from time to time. It brings back some old memories watching gun smoke. All right. Homicides were so bad in 1871 
Confederate and Union soldiers came together and they formed a new organization trying to limit the violence with gunfire across the country. They called themselves the National Rifle Association, the NRA. They decided to have various kinds of sports shooting in which people can win money and prizes by showing their accuracy using targets and not another human body. And so you start seeing these gun shows across the country here. That's how Annie Oakley was discovered in Ohio through an NRA sponsored shooting contest. And she won the contest against Frank Butler, a young man from Ireland. He's about 21 years of old, and he was 15, and she beat him. And he falls in love with her, and they get married. Now, they both go to jail today, but they got married here, guys, and they'll eventually join the Wild, the Wild West shows of Buffalo Bill Cody. But they got their start here in these shooting contests, and you had these sharpshooters who went from town to town with the NRA and their organization having these shooting contests. The whole idea was to end gun violence. What is the NRA up to today? I don't see very much work trying to limit gun violence. I don't see very many shooting contests going on across the country with the NRA. I think they went through and re-promoted themselves. They might do themselves a whole lot more good than what they're doing today. And they might get a better, a better response to what they're doing from the past and what they're doing today here. That's just my opinion, okay? Now, with all of this Southerners trying to regain the Southern political scene, here comes a new system to the South that's evolved to make sure that the black Americans stay in their place. White America has found another way to rule over black America through white supremacy. You know, in the 1840s, we had what is called the minstrel shows. The minstrel shows were, were slapstick comedy. They had music. Uh, Gilbert and Sullivan was, it was very popular during this time period. Stephen Foster's songs were very popular in this time period. And one of the big songs here was a song called Jim Crow. Daddy Rice, a musician, wrote a song called Jim Crow. Jim Crow is a stable hand. And they used the terminology Jim Crow to explain or identify the new white supremacy system. I want you guys to realize something. This system has only been gone about 50 years. When I was a little boy, I grew up in the Jim Crow system. I had to learn the rules as a white Southern child about Jim Crow. And I thought it was the most stupidest thing I ever heard of, but still as part of polite white Southern society that you obey these rules. And your grandmas and your grandpas who were born in the 1890s, and early 1900s, they were the second generation away from the war and they really were war sponsors. They really helped uh, held up the, the mythology of the lost cause and the American Confederacy. A lot of these folks were un, well, how, how can I put it? They were uh, unreconstructed Southerners. They believed in what the lost cause was all about on the Southern side. One of my professors at Ole Miss, Charles Reagan Wilson wrote a book called Baptized in Blood. And it deals with all this stuff. William Faulkner wrote about all this in his novels. And he used the, the stories from the white women who were usually the instigators of this system. The white men didn't put up those Confederate monuments all over the South in the 1890s to remember the lost cause, remember the war. It was the women. They were the daughters of the Confederacy, a highly racist group of women who did all this stuff. We put up these statues here across the South so, so we won't forget about the war. And we'll honor all these great men who were murderers, who were treasonous against the country. It's crazy stuff here. And so they put a statue of Robert E. Lee in the downtown New Orleans. And they have Stone Mountain, Georgia. And we have all these Confederate monuments all over the place here, guys. And it's all done by these women in spite 
during this Jim Crow era. If they had built, they had, they had gone to build great museums for the Confederacy, there'd be no issue because you could choose to go into those museums. But depending on the public, you don't do this. And so these ladies did a real disservice to the American people, particularly of today, by putting all those statues up, honoring all these all these men who were part of the war here in this time period. So I said there are treasonous against the United States. Okay, Jim Crow is going to go across the South here. Okay, these Jim Crow laws is going to segregate people in their everyday lives. They said that separate was equal and public facilities. Separate but equal and public facilities. That means that your theaters and your opera houses could not be integrated. A lot of time in the theaters that were started, the movie theaters in the early 20th century that were started, you had Black Day for movies. African Americans were allowed to go to movies only on a Thursday. The rest of the time it's only for white Americans. You had white barber shops, you had black barber shops. You had white beauty shops, you had black beauty shops. You had white floors, you had black floors. You had white women's clothing stores and you had black women's clothing stores and men's clothing stores of, of the various the various races white church does not have black members during jim crow if any church does have any black members they sit in the balcony of the church they're not out on the main floor they must take they must be segregated here in this time period okay you'll have black train cars you'll have white train cars Later on, you'll have white buses and you'll have black buses. You'll have white sections in a bus and a black section in a bus that got Rosa Parks in trouble. Everyday life, your water faucets. When I was a little boy going to Pensacola in the early 1960s, we lived in Crestview. We'd drop Pensacola to buy school clothes and buy Christmas clothes and buy Easter clothes. Pensacola is the best place to go shopping. Highway 90 was a brick road, and it took us almost two hours to get to Scola from Crestview. Get back up in traffic, get back to the Milton and Pace and so forth. It was a while to get to Scola. And we'd go shopping. Downtown on Palo Fox Street was J.C. Penney's. Right down the street was Sears. Across the street was the San Carlos Motel, one of the most grandest hotels in the American South. They tore down in the 1980s, said it's gonna fall in. It's a, it's a death trap, it's a hazard. It took them almost a year to tear it down because it's so well built. They should have remodeled it and, and modified it and kept it, but they tore it down. Our grand hotel here in Valparaiso burned to the ground in 1989. And it's caused by an arsonist. We all know, or I should say 1979, it was called by an arsonist. We know that. It all should have been remodeled and rebuilt. It was not done. It went away. But in that penny store, you had a white bathroom for women, a white bathroom for men, and a third bathroom with a C on the door for colored. Women and men of, the, of, of African Americans had to go to the same bathroom. They were not segregated between the sexes. You had white water faucets in J.C. Penney's and you had colored water faucets in J.C. Penney's. My dad told me, now Dave, you gotta be careful. Now, daddy was not a real segregationist. He went through World War II and came home changed. He saw the death camps in Germany and came home changed. But privately, he was for civil rights. As a matter of fact, when our church decided to vote if we should have black members in 1963, the Valparaiso Baptist Church. My dad stood up and said why we should do it. All the other men was against it. And dad stood up and being a school principal and having a little bit of clout, he convinced a bunch of them to vote to allow we have black members and it did pass. Those who did not vote, were, who did not vote left the church and dad just said good riddance. And I thought, why are we voting for people who come to church Jesus does not care what color we are. He says, everybody who believes shall be saved. And there's no exclusion with everybody. And my dad took me to the side and said, now, David, when we go to town, I was about five years old. 
we go to town, I want you to look for the W over the water faucet. That W means Weatherford, and that's your water faucet. Well, the only problem is the other water faucet had a C on top of the other water faucet for color. My mother was a Causey. And I said, do I go use mother's water faucet or do I do use daddy's water faucet? And I asked him that. And he said, you little smart ass. <laughs> he got to tickle at me because he realized that I was seeing things through a different perspective. The new generation were going to see things for, through a different perspective. We didn't care. We did not care. But boy, my grandparents, they were Jim Crow all the way. My, my grandma, she had help that came to the house. One of the ladies that she brought to the house was named Miss Sholey. And I asked grandma one day if Miss Sholey was her sister. And my grandma almost came unglued. And I remember Miss Sholey cooking all the dinners and all the meals for us. And putting on the table, we had a big, huge red dining table on the front porch where we ate around. And Miss Sholey would be in there struggling, frying up okra and frying up pork chops and all this stuff and bring them to the table. When the dinner was served, Miss Sholey was nowhere to be seen. She was not allowed to eat with us because she was black. And that hurts my heart today. And I remember going into my grandma's kitchen and there at the little table sitting by herself was Miss Sholey. Eat her peas and cornbread, her turnip greens, and join her, join her dinner that she had cooked for the, for the white folks, but not allowed to eat with us. And I would sit down with her and I would talk to her. And I learned a lot of things I would not have known if I had not been with Miss Sholey. I love that woman. In 1965, when all the riots break out across the South and all the trouble happens, her children who lived in Detroit, Michigan, came and got her and carried her to Michigan. We never saw her again. I do not know what happened to Miss Sholey. And that's one of the regrets of my life, that I do not know what happened to her. Jim Crow was a horrible, horrible system, guys, that people could not be together and love one another in the way we should have loved each other. And I also think about Miss Sholey and the life that she lived. When I knew her, she's in her 50s. Horrible history. I want you guys to watch a movie called The Help. That kind of explains what's going on here in this time period, when I was a kid, and all the stuff going on. Read about Rosa Parks. Watch those movies that I put on your, on your Facebook page. If you understand this stuff and see what's going on here with these various groups of people. It's very interesting to watch all this and understand what's going on here in this time period. Okay, Jim Crow segregation is gonna have waiting rooms, waiting rooms for white folks and for black. You go to the hospital, you got a black entry to the hospital. If you even have allowed black folks at all. Billy, I'm sorry, Betsy Smith died in Clarksdale, Mississippi from a car wreck because the hospital in, in Clarksdale was only for white folks. They had, to load, they had to load Betsy into a car and go back to Memphis to get her hospital attention and she died on the way up Highway 61. She died because the hospital in Clarksdale would not allow her medical attention because she's a black woman. So you had white interests, you had black interests. You go to the drugstore, and the drugstore was a, was, a, was a lunch counter. The lunch counter was for fast food. We didn't have parties on McDonald's or Taco Bell or Saxby's or Chick-fil-A during this time period. The downtown drugstores had a lunch counter. That was, that was your fast food for a quick lunch at work. You go to the lunch counter, they had little round stools. You'll sit on a stool and a black lady would help you. She was a waitress. She would take your order and hand your order over to the fry cook. And they made hot dogs and hamburgers and cheese dogs and corn dogs and cheese, sandwich, cheese, cheese sandwiches. They had tuna fish and chicken salad and pulled pork. They had French fries. 
They had pork rinds. They were homemade pork rinds. They had a soda fountain. They had the best drinks in the whole world. You guys have never had a Coke. All you get is a can or a bottle, and a plastic bottle at that. And these Cokes here were mighty good. And a lot of times they served them with real chopped up ice. And those things got so cold and so good. And those Pepsis and those Cokes were delicious here in this time period. Those milkshakes, those malted milkshakes were unbelievable during this time period. The black ladies were the workers, but only white folks could order from the lunch counter. A black, if a black person wanted a quick meal, they had to go to the wind at the end of the building and order from the alleyway and hope that he'd eventually get his order. He'll eventually get his order. Sometimes he didn't get ordered at all. He paid for his food and he didn't get any food. That's not unusual. Okay? So this came back. Okay? Laws were written to forbid African Americans from living in white neighborhoods. Segregation was enforced at public pools, phone booths, hospitals, asylums, jails, and residential homes for the elderly and for the handicapped. Some states required separate textbooks for black and white students. In Atlanta, African Americans and court systems were given different Bibles from the white folks to swear on. Marriages and um, and common law marriages between whites and blacks were strictly forbidden in most Southern states. My dad told me about a gentleman over, over in Neshoba County, Mississippi in the 1930s. He's a white man who married a black woman. And they truly loved one another. They had lots of children. They had like eight kids. But yet he was looked down upon by society because he married this woman. Remember, guys, Virginia passed a law in, seven, in 1690 that forbade white folks from marrying black folks. That law is not, is not dealt with by the Supreme Court until 1967. 1967, 42 years ago, or 43 years ago. And they allowed mixed marriages for the first time. I remember going to church. Here in Valpy Baptist Church, people hollering, I don't know why they're allowing that, 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 black, that black man to marry that white woman. I just don't understand what's going on here. I don't understand what's going on here. It's going to ruin Cynthia marriage. I heard the same thing four or five years ago about gay marriage. Has it ruined marriage? No, it has not. It's created new American families and new identities and new ways of seeing life. It has changed American history here. It's not uncommon to see signs posted on towns and city limits warning African Americans that they were not welcome there, particularly after evening. Nice had a sign, guys. The sign sits up there where you turn onto College Boulevard heading to the college. It's up there where the gas station is on the right hand side coming toward Nice. And the sign used the N word on the on the sign, and it says, "If you are, you better not be in in Knoxville past sundown." And that sign was up there until the mid 1960s. I don't know who has that sign now. It might be the Block the Baker Block Museum. I don't know who has that sign. I know the Val P Museum does not have it, but I'm sure it's somewhere that sign is still around. And it forbade him. It had a sign here at Valparaiso, coming in from Valparaiso and Nashville, and also coming in from Crestview, coming in from Highway 20 from, from Freeport. Y'all don't realize that this here was a Jim Crow place. And a lot of your military boys in the 1950s were scared to come to Valpy or Nashville because of being threatened. They were scared to go to Destin. I know a lot of black families that lived here in our area that were scared to drive through Alabama or Mississippi. I know one man that he would drive up to Atlanta and head up to Tennessee and go across to Memphis and then down to Arkansas and come back down to Louisiana going to Houston to try to avoid any kind of problems he might have on the road here. 
Do y'all know they published a book just for African Americans who travel? And it gave you directions and how to handle yourself in various states with Jim Crow laws. It's called the Green Book. And it was published. And it told you how to handle yourselves in various locations. You should get pulled over by the police. And also told you what restaurants, what hotels would welcome you in the South. What gas stations would allow you to get gas here. Some of you guys watch a movie called Driving Miss Daisy. And her and her and her friend, black gentleman, her chauffeur, carrying her from Atlanta to Mobile in the 1950s for a birthday party. She's Jewish and he's black. And they get pulled over by the Highway Patrol here in, the, in, 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 in uh, Alabama. And them trying to explain what a black man was doing with an old Jewish woman. Y'all need watching this stuff, guys, and get and, and get yourself educated in what's going on here. If you don't learn what's going on here, and we start this polite history, you'll never hear it. You'll never know about it. And you guys have got to realize a lot of stuff takes place in American history, and it goes deep. And I try to give y'all as much as I possibly can in these history classes so you'll understand what it was like. That's why in History 2 class, I do a lot of personal stories because I have been around since 1951 and I've seen all this stuff. I have witnessed all this stuff. So you can understand what's going on here with these Jim Crow laws here in this, this time period. But here's the craziest part of all. All these white supremacist Southerners who are middle class or own up in class are going to hire African Americans for, for household workers. And to kill the mockingbird, Caprinia is the is the maid here, the housekeeper here for Atticus Finch and his children. And y'all watch the movie, y'all read the book when 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 Caprinia, when Caprinia or Cal carries the kids to her church on a Sunday morning. And when Jim goes with Atticus to the Robinson house to explain the court proceedings, and Bob Ewell is there to intimidate. Y'all watch this stuff. I want you guys to realize that if I didn't teach American history, I'd be teaching literature, and I'd be doing Southern Lit, and we'd be, we, we'd be reading Eudori Welty, and Zora Neale Hurston, and William Faulkner, and Richard Wright. Harper Lee. Carson McCullers. Truman Capote. Who shines a bright light on all of this foolishness. I asked my grandma, she's an older woman. She's gonna, she down, she's 84 years old. She's about 82. I said, Mama, I said, Mama, how do you feel about all this mess going on, this civil rights mess? And, and uh, and this uh, this white supremacy. I had talk in her language, or she wouldn't understood me. And I say, um, why? Um, what do you think about this Jim Crow stuff? And here's an old lady. She told me. She says, David, it was the stupidest thing I ever had to put up with. And I said, why did you? I had no choice. I was in white society. I was in Southern Mississippi. I was in a rural area, and you had to fit in, or you'd be totally ostracized. You're caught in the trap, guys, is what it boils down to. Grandma was a very interesting person to talk about all this stuff. I asked Grandma Weatherford. She was born in 1894. She died in 1984. And I asked her about all this. And she says, David, she says, I didn't really get involved in all this stuff. She said, I had a lot of friends who were African-American. I grew up in a poor community. I was a poor child. I was not a child of great privilege. My grandmother, what cause he was. My grandpa was. My Weathers were not. They lived in the Shelby County, Mississippi, one of the poorest counties in the state of Mississippi. And she says, she says, I understood what they were going through and what was going on here. And she says, luckily, I was able to avoid it most times and not be a part of it. So guys, it affected both sides here uh, in this time period. But here you have all this black help in the white households. They're called the help. They hired women to be the cooks, 
to clean the house, to wash the clothes, to keep the children, whatever the children. They hired the men to take care of the yard work, to have, help them with their gardens and all this kind of stuff. Their husbands were too busy in the law office or, or in the retail shops or whatever they might be, in the factories being supervisors or being managers. And so they had the help here, guys. They did the yard work and also did the household work in this time period. On the outside, we have Jim Crow. On the inside, we have them working together. But you still have that white supremacy. Y'all watch the help. And you'll see here how these white women of privilege will treat these folks here in this time period. You know, at the Valparaiso Library for the last 10 years, I've offered a history class for the older folks. Same class you guys get, same thing you guys go through, but it's for the folks who are over the age of 70. My, most of my folks are between the age of 75 and 90. We have some real interesting discussions because they lived a lot longer in Jim Crow than I did. These guys were born in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, and up into the 1940s. And they understood a lot more than what I did about all this stuff. I learned more from those guys than anybody else. One of my ladies who just recently passed away was named Lois. Lois was from Memphis, Tennessee. Her father was a physician in the United States Army, and he worked in the Army Hospital there in Memphis. Her mother was of high society. She was a party girl. She was the one who went to all those tea parties. They served Long Island iced teas, and they played bridge, and the guy came home drunk on Tuesday nights and had to sober up on Wednesdays from the card games they played. She'd go to the church and be a part of the missionary movement on, on Thursdays with, with the WMU and all that kind of stuff. On weekends, they'd go out and eat dinners with their friends and so forth, and Lois couldn't go. But her mother hired a lady to take care of her. She was five years old, and this lady came to their house in Memphis. And Lois said, she was my mama. She was my playmate. She loved me. She told me how smart I was. She built me up. She built me, gave me self-confidence. She helped me with my reading and my writing and my schoolwork. I loved her. She was like my mama. And she said, then I turned 12 years old and mother fired her. Mother says, you no longer need a black lady in your life to help you get yourself together, that she served her purpose. And Lois told us, she said, I mourned her. I cried every night for five years because I missed that woman. She was my lifesaver. She was the one that I had to, to hold on to. And once I tw turned 12, I had nobody, and I needed somebody because mama was too busy out playing, not being a mom. And I love that woman, and I'm so sorry that I lost her. You see how horrible it is in this system. I know, I know young boys um, whose, whose household servant was had grandkids or had children and she'd bring them to the house once in a while and the and the little boys would play together william fought writes about this in his books like intruder of the dust where the book starts off at gettysburg and the two little boys are playing the battle at gettysburg and one little boy is black and the little boy is white and they're playmates when they turn 12 years old Jim Crow comes in and says y'all can't be friends no more y'all too old for all this play and their friendship comes apart. And there's 60 year old men going down the sidewalk in these southern towns. And the white man looks up, here comes his old buddy. He just nods at him while the other man gets off the sidewalk because he's black. Black folks might be on the sidewalk passing black folks. They got in the street. I never, ever want to see this stuff take place again. A horrible, horrible thing to look at, to see what's going on here. And the South brings in Jim Crow right behind these bourbon Democrats 
and the failure of the lost cause. Mr. Grant pulls the federal, uh, Mr. Grant says the South cannot be saved. It cannot be saved. Okay, it cannot be saved. Across the South, lynchings increase here because of Jim Crow laws. And it's going to be a young lady who comes out of Memphis, Tennessee, whose name is Ida Wells. And Ida Wells begins to write in her newspaper about the horrors of lynching. She starts the anti-lynching campaign. Ida Wells today is being celebrated. People are discussing Ida Wells today, 120 years later from her time period of writing these anti-lynching papers. Ida Wells was so, was so impressive and so popular across the South that the Ku Klux Klan and the White Riders go into her post, goes into her printing shop and they burn her down. And this lady is forced to go to Chicago for her safety. And all during the late 1800s into the early 20th century, until the 1930s, Ida Wells is writing about lynchings and how bad they are, trying to expose it. So we go from abolition, abolitionist writing in the 1830s and 1840s and 1850s to the anti-lynching articles in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and the first part of the 20th century. We go from one social issue to another social issue. Okay. Then here comes a major problem. In 1876, we have an election for the presidency. Mr. Grant has served two terms. Running for the Democratic Party is going to be Samuel Tilden. Samuel Tilden is the governor of New York. Running against him as a Republican is Rutherford B. Hayes. Mr. Hayes is a senator from Ohio. Okay. The election of 1876 has lots of polling problems. Number one, the federal troops are not there anymore to help black voters vote. And across the, and across the South, they have passed rules and laws to disenfranchise black voters. They have what is called the literacy test. They'll give you a document to read. If you can't read it, you can't read, and therefore you don't pass a literacy test. If you do pass a literacy test, they'll hand you a book of Shakespeare to read. As you stumble over Shakespeare, they say, oh, you can't read after all. So they use the, they use the written word to disenfranchise the black voters. And then some states passed a law that said, if your grandpa did not vote in 1860, then you can't vote called the grandfather clause. Well, no black men voted in 1860. Very few poor white men voted in 1860. So this, this, so this disenfranchised with the literacy test, it, dis it disenfranchised both the poor white voters who are uneducated and your former slave voters. They hit both groups. Remember, the Federalist Party under Mr. Hamilton says the poor should have no say in the American government. That's pretty bad. The Republicans under Jefferson said that all men should vote. But the Federalists wanted, wanted restrictions, okay? And so you start seeing this come again, trying to bring restriction to the vote here under the Federalist. And then they pass what is called the poll tax that you've got to pay a tax in order to vote. Can't pay your tax, you can't vote. The poll tax, the literacy test, and the grandfather clause were all brought into position here to stop these folks from voting. You know, in 1932, my grandpa Wesford went to the polling place in Philadelphia, Mississippi. He showed him his credentials, he showed him his driver's license, the whole nine yards, and they said, well, Mr. Henry, have you paid your poll tax? Grandpa said, well, what's the poll tax? They said, if you don't pay a poll tax, you can't vote. The poll tax was $5. $5 to Grandpa was like a million dollars to anybody else was in this time period. Grandpa didn't have $5. And he told my dad, if I had $5, I would have gone and bought y'all a new pair of shoes. So Grandpa couldn't vote. 
but he sure lost his property during the Great Depression. Had to go through and re had to go through and move and buy a whole new farm using federal loans in the late 1930s to buy his to buy a new farm because the banks took his away from him and he almost had it paid for. They stole people's property, guys. You look at the housing market up to 2008 and people lost their houses. They paid in these houses 10 and 15 years and they foreclosed on them. Stole the houses, stole the money from them, they paid on these houses and then went through and resold the houses and made more money off of them. Mr. Lincoln warned us. You guys rein this bunch in, and they're gonna be stealing from the American people. And one day they'll control the whole the whole country. You see this happening here, guys. Okay. Well, they can't decide who won the election of 17, uh, the election of 1876. Tilden actually won it by the popular vote. The Electoral College, he did not win. Well, it goes, it goes to the Electoral College. They can't decide. It goes to the House of Representatives. And in the House, they found out that three states had voting problems. Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. As a matter of fact, the Florida votes were put on train to go to the county Washington, D.C., and the train derailed in South Carolina, and a lot of the votes got displaced. Yeah, they got thrown into a creek. They disappeared because the train derailed. And so the Florida vote was not complete. Louisiana had voting problems when the polls, so did South Carolina. And it looks like nobody's going to win the presidency here in this time period. And finally, Mr. Hayes, the Republican, goes to the state of Florida's representatives in the House, and he says, if you guys will give me your votes, I will end Reconstruction in Florida. Then he goes to Louisiana. If you guys will give me your votes, I'll end Reconstruction in Louisiana. Well, that means Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas, they lose their federal troops. And Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, those federal troops go away. Mississippi, they all go away. Then he goes to South Carolina and tells South Carolina, if you give me your votes, They'll take federal troops out of South Carolina and North Carolina. All is left is really Virginia and Tennessee. So in a backward, bad, in a bad backroom deal, Rutherford B. Hayes will steal the election from Mr. Tilden by making deals with three Southern states. And on March the 4th, 17, uh, 1877, March the 4th, 1877, Mr. Tilden, Mr. Uh, Hayes becomes the new president. And Reconstruction ends across the South. Reconstruction ends across the South. Federal troops go home, and the South is now on its own. Okay? A lot of folks, when Hayes took office, a lot of folks across the country said, the South has finally won the Civil War. They won it politically. And these radical Republicans were the ones who actually ended Reconstruction. They did not rein in the wealthy class. And the wealthy class goes crazy with the Gilded Age until 1900. By that time, you'd have Mr. Roosevelt come into office as president TR, and he starts regulating and trying to tear up these big monopoly companies that are trying to take over America. He actually saved us from socialism. He actually saved us from communism, guys. The truth be known about it. Russia didn't do this. The czar, the czar lost it. Roosevelt saved us. Between Roosevelt and, and William Howard Taft, we got saved from a lot of from a lot of issues. We'll talk about all that stuff later on in class. Okay. Well, guys, Mr. Tilden won the election here. When he wins the election, here comes the loss of all this property to the freed people. All these former slaves begin to lose their property. And here's what happened. The white folks who originally owned this property begin to show up. These were cousins and relatives of the people that once owned this land. And in their possession was the original land deed the land deed from the 1820 land grant. They had the original deed. And they took these black families to court. 
All they had were federal land deeds. These guys had the original state land deeds. And of course, it becomes a state rights issue. And these local white judges begin to hear these court cases with 12 white men on the jury. And one by one, these former slaves lost their property. The white folks took the property over. They were thrown off their land. They had built their houses. They had built their barns. It looks just like Indian removal all over again. In some cases, the records in the courthouse played a major role in who got the land. So the white Southerners decided to burn down the courthouses. Do you know we had over 300 courthouse fires across the South in this time period? They burned down the courthouse to destroy all the records. So the only thing they had left was that original land deed. Connecticut County, if you had Evergreen, they had three courthouse fires during this time period. A lot of your towns, a lot of your southern towns had courthouse fires. So a lot of your courthouses were built, were, re, were rebuilt in the 1880s and early, early 1890s because they'd been burned down in the, 18, the late 1870s, early 1880s. And these folks got thrown off the land. Some of your poor whites who had federal land grants also lost out on this too, okay? And with this will come the rise of sharecropping. Here comes the landowner who just stole your land away from you. And he might have stole the land about 20 or 30 people who lived around you because this had once been a plantation. You got over a thousand acres that had been 40 acre parcels, and those 40 acre guys lost the land and he went back to the thousand acres again for one white man to control. And he went to these poor white farmers, he went to the poor black farmers, and he said, Y'all, I'll tell you guys something. I know y'all are good farmers, and y'all make a good living farming for me. If you will come and farm my land for me, I will give you a house to live in, I'll give you a mule to plow with, I will give you plow tools, I'll give you, I'll give you plow lines, the mule, the whole nine yards. All I require is that I get 60% of what you produce and you get 40%. When you have nothing, that sounds fairly good. So you sign up. You get an old three room shotgun house. You got a front door and a back door that line up with each other and you got a partition between three rooms. You got, so you got two, you got two walls inside the house. You got three rooms of a living area with a bed usually in it and two beds in the middle room and then a kitchen out back in the back part of the house. You sit on the front porch and shoot a shotgun to the house. That's why it's called a shotgun house. You get a mule, you get your, you get your furnish of tools and plows and seeds and fertilizer and the, and the mule and all this good stuff, but you were not told you gotta pay rent on this. He decides to rent your house for $20 a year, rent your mule for $20 a year, and to give you your furnish for $10 a year. That is $50 you're already in debt to him for just to get started. Well, guys, you start in wintertime. You got to go hunt for food. You got to go hunt squirrels for squirrel stew and all this stuff and rabbits to feed your family with or white-tailed deer or a wild hog. In the meantime, you're going out in that cold weather trying to get the fields prepared, getting them rode up into terraces and getting those stumps out of the fields and the roots out of the fields so you, can, so you can cultivate these fields and grow some crops. Around the first of, the first of March, you get your fertilizer, you got your, you already have your mule, get your fertilizer, and you start getting your seeds. And on Good Friday, the Friday before Easter is a, is a day that you plant. Both my grandfathers planted their fields and their gardens on Good Friday. It's good luck to plant your crops on Good Friday. But you don't have any real food. You can't produce sugar. You cannot produce flour or any of this stuff because you have to buy it. And the old landowner realizes that you need some help with commodities. 
And so he builds what is called a country store. And he gives all of his sharecroppers credit. He gives all of his sharecroppers credit. The owner of the company store or the country store is usually one of his sons or a trusted, or a trusted person that he can rely upon. And he tells them, make you out a ticket and for everything you buy, charge you 30% interest. Well, you come in, you got to go through and buy, you got to buy a second flower. You got to go through and buy some coffee and some sugar. You know, a lot of folks learn how to go through and grow sugar cane. They would squeeze and make syrup out of it and use the syrup for sweeteners. Yeah, you pour sugar, you pour syrup into your coffee, guys. You pour syrup into your lemonade and syrup into your, into your iced tea. Syrup is just as good as sweetener because it is sugar. It just has not been crystallized. And so they had to find ways around it. They started growing up enough, enough corn to carry corn to the grist mill and have cornmeal. My dad told me a lot of nights that he had cornbread for, for his, or cornbread for biscuits in the morning or at night for, for dinner. It's not unusual. When you're poor, you don't have enough, enough you can't buy flour, you gotta use cornmeal. And you grow enough corn, got enough cornmeal to take care of your family, okay? So guys, these folks started buying stuff out of the company store, out of the country store, not knowing they're being charged interest on it. Well, end of the season comes, and here comes payday. You have made $300 from the crop that you have grown. That is your cut, that's your 40%, okay? The old, the old landowner has got close to $500 from your crops. But then he hands you the bill for the company store. And you owe the store $350. And the old landowner says, you know, you tried real hard this year. You did a pretty good job. Let's next year, let's try it again next year. And you might come out even. In sharecropping, you always come up short. You don't pay off your debts. You cannot leave that land. You cannot move on. Sharecropping is nothing more than legalized slavery. It involves poor white folks and it, pours, it involves the poor black folks. The former people who had owned some land had lost it and now they're sharecropping. Both my grandparents got involved in sharecropping during the Great Depression. Grandpa worked for the worked for the, the family on the hill. My grandpa, because he lost his land, he was all paid for. He lost his land. They took it away from him. He had a few little outstanding loans on various items that he had purchased, and they took his land away from him. Both grandparents had paid for a second mortgage, had paid for a second land by 1970. I remember when they went through and burned their mortgages. They went through and burned, and burned those notes. They finally paid their land off for a second time. My father grew up in sharecropping. I know all about it. I've heard all the stories. I have walked those fields with him plowing. He started as eight years old plowing. You know, we're the first generation of children. My generation, first generation of children who did not work as children because my parents had to work on the farms. And after World War II, they all came home and went to college and got, very, got different jobs. They said their children will never work like that. We had the first kids that had a childhood because we didn't have to work as children. All we had little chores to do. We got, we, we got a little bit of, little bit of, of uh, money, you know, for, for doing odd jobs around the house, you know, got our allowances. We go to the movies on a Saturday afternoon when they're shopping or save up some money, go buy you a new pair of shoes or whatever you want to go get. But, uh, I was affected by sharecropping. I know all about it. And my father, what they went through in this time period and in this time period. Okay. So guys, the whole system of sharecropping is based on debt. Make sure those farmers who work for you are staying in debt. How big was sharecropping? Well, Florida was 30% sharecropping. But that's only from Pensacola to Jacksonville. They didn't go into Central Florida because they don't have a Central Florida in this time period. There's no there's no real uh, Sanford or, or frost proof or West Palm Beach, they're not down here yet. Miami, they're not down here yet. 
all the farming was done north of Orlando from those great lakes around Orlando all the way up to the Georgia state line is where most of your farming was and out for Pensacola. So Florida was 37% sharecropping. Louisiana, 60%. South Carolina, 62%. Alabama, 58%. Texas, 49% were sharecroppers. California, 26% were sharecroppers. Nebraska, 37% of you people were sharecroppers in Nebraska. All right, Ohio, 28% of you people were sharecroppers. So guys, it's going to go across the country. This new system of, 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 of enslaving your poor people who do not have the right to vote, they have, do not have the right to, to any kind of legal system because it's all stacked up against them by white supremacy, it's going to go nationwide here in this time period. It's going to get crazy. So the big question here, guys, to conclude this lecture is, what did white Southerners want? Well, they wanted economic security. They wanted unrestricted politics. They wanted homeland rule, white supremacy. They wanted a solution for poor whites and for the emancipated slaves, as long as it involved them. They want to be out of it. And they want an end to the violence want an end to the violence. We still want that today in America. It's still going on today. What did Black Southerners want? The right to own their own land, to have economic security and economic freedom. They wanted better school systems. You know, after they killed the Freedmen's Bureau, the school system went downhill big time. The Black schools went under state control and they didn't get anything. The textbooks they had were all the old ripped up and torn up textbooks they came from the white schools. And the desk, you, the kids couldn't even write on the desk because they're so full of holes you couldn't write on your pe with, with paper and, and pen or paper and pencil because the desktop was too holy. They just got to dig out all the leftover stuff. So they want the right to have suitable schools. They want the right to vote. They want the right to move about and find new opportunities. You know, a lot of people did move. Booker T. Washington's family moved out of Virginia, went to Western West Virginia when slavery ended. A lot of folks went out toward the West. A lot of your cowboys were black cowboys who had been enslaved, who left the South behind to go out West to get a new career, to find a new way of living. A lot of them were on the cattle range, on the, ca on the, ca on the cattle rides, and, and out here working the chuck wagons and all this stuff here during the cowboy time period. They want the right to find their former family members. Remember, I told you how they split the families up in the 1820s. They took part of the families to different to different plantations, and they did not know where they were. And they, after 1865, these folks not only moved, they also went to go find their family members. And they did find their family members. And that's some of the greatest reunions that took place in the, eight, the late 1860s, early 1870s in American history when they found each other. Okay, they want the right to have legal marriages. The old master wouldn't let them marry legally on the plantation. He says, that man marries that woman, that man has more authority over her than I do. So they outlawed marriage between the people here on the plantations. And to show that you had been married, they jumped the broomstick. And when slavery ended, they go to the churches and they get legally married. They want to be married before the eyes of the Lord. And of course, these former slaves want an end to the violence here. So I hope that you guys see this in a whole different perspective than what you have seen. Being a white male Southerner growing up from 1950 onward, I have seen all this stuff. I have talked to a lot of people who went through all this stuff. I saw my father try to fight for civil rights movement as a white man trying to be kind of secretive because white society was scoring him. And being a school principal, he could have lost his job by supporting Black America during this time period. I remember talking to my racist grandmothers and my grandfathers and, and heard what they had to say. I grew up around racist uncles that I know were part of the Ku Klux Klan. And these guys were not very much put together. A lot of these guys were veterans of World War II who had major PTSD. 
and I was scared of it. I was totally scared of it. And I know that one or two of these guys were probably in the Ku Klux Klan. And one of them was in Philadelphia when those boys got killed, those young men got killed in 1964 from the Civil Rights uh, Freedom Rides. And I was surprised that Billy was not part of that bunch who killed those boys. So you start seeing all this from a different perspective. And we cannot forget this history. We cannot go through and sugarcoat this history by doing what is going to be called in the future the public history, where everything is lovely and gory. It's going to be a lovely time in America with no kind of strife or no kind of problems here in that new public history. You're going to see the black legend be relived in American history if that should happen. And you history two, you history one students know what the black legend was where Spain went through and told the Europeans as they invaded the new world what a love fest it was over here and how they went through and helped people and saved people and made Christianity. Where in reality, they're bringing the black death. They were bringing in the smallpox. They were killing people because they would not become Christian. They brought the Inquisition with them. They raped young men and young girls. They pillaged, they plundered, they stole. They came over here for, for, they came over here for glory gold and God, and God didn't play very much a role in it. It's mostly glory and gold. That's the black legend. And so you look at this new public history, and it could be the new black legend. We go through and we're telling lies and trying to hide the truth. Okay? So this is your lecture that deals with reconstruction, and um, I hope that you have enjoyed of uh, the, the class and what we talked about here in history one class for you guys who are in history two class this is your first lecture i've decided to make this a lecture that takes care of both history one and history two class and so i have the first lecture already on blackboard in history two class so you guys will have all this stuff to look at okay all right i will see you guys later